Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and tonight on Murder, She Wrote, we have a scandal. Oh my. Oh yes, we're talking sex, violence, book burning, and Seth Hazlitt sporting a really cheesy headband. Season 5 had so many weird episodes. You may recall Something Borrowed, Someone Blue came out around the same time, and even though it was definitely on a different level, the rest of the episodes from that year seemed to follow a similar format of bonkers plots and ridiculous characters. This one, titled The Sins of Castle Cove, is about a salacious novel written by a former resident of Cabot Cove. When it hits the bestseller list, the other locals are not too pleased by how closely it resembles their own dirty laundry, resulting in a murder. Yeah, it's a little dramatic. Like all good things, this story begins in the beauty parlor. That is where all the tea is spilled. Interestingly, this scene reminded me of Steel Magnolias, which was also released in 1989 and heavily featured beauty shop gossip. As somebody always said, if you can't say anything nice about anybody, come sit by me. <laughs> As they are chit-chatting, one of the women asks if they can watch TV, to which another responds, I do hope it is an educational TV. I hate educational TV. Oh, give me some of that Brett Michaels rock of love. Also, this woman's name is Ideal. It sounds like it could be a punchline of some duo comedy act. Her name is Ideal. Oh, so what's her name? It's Ideal, but what's her name? <laughs> <laughs> Sybil, a young woman who used to live in Cabot Cove, is on television being interviewed about her new book, The Sins of Castle Cove. Gosh, it's so subtle. The interviewer asks if the gratuitous nature of the book is based in reality, and she says it is not, but the ladies are dying to get a copy. Sybil credits Jessica as her main influence, as she was her high school English teacher. Jess is like, aw, that's sweet, hope she doesn't suck. She also goes on to explain to Seth that Sybil was very bright, but often troubled. Surprised she didn't send you an advance copy. You being one of her three greatest influences. Oh god, influencer culture, am I right? The small, tight-knit town shows great interest in the spicy book, and when I say the town, I mean a bunch of Twilight moms. Miriam, one of the beauty parlor regulars, is hoping it's a love story. The only books I ever read are romantic novels with happy endings. <laughs> Well, I'm sure there are some happy endings in this book. Ahem. The skeezy book owner makes a skeezy pass at Miriam. Surely this won't come back to bite him. Seth isn't impressed with the book, especially since it's not cautiously written. Sybil describes a character named Dr. Valiant as a curmudgeon, which is clearly referencing Seth, and she also wrote an older professor character named K.C. Feather. K.C. Feather. Regardless, Jess decides to read her former student's book. Oh my. Oh yeah. Eve Simpson makes a late night visit to Jess's house, completely upset about her portrayal as a sex-crazed siren. She makes the claim that filth like this shouldn't even be allowed in print. You've always been passionately opposed to censorship. Well, this is different, Jessica. This offends me! Miriam is also not happy, but for more serious reasons. In fact, among all of the weird gossipy characters, there is a serious plot that involves her and her abusive husband, Noah. She tries to hide the book from her husband, but he finds it in the fridge. Oh, you wouldn't like it. Hey, I I know a few words. A woman wrote it. I don't know how you can stand this junk. Hurry up. Works every time. Sexism to the rescue. In other news, have you ever wanted a vest that looks like a potholder? Sybil shows up on Jess's doorstep, which seems like an unwise idea. If I smeared my entire town, I'd probably stay as far away as possible. She asks if she can bunk with Jess for a while. Thank you, Mrs. Fletcher. You are my favorite person in the whole world. Not according to your book. Meanwhile, a hooded figure breaks into the bookstore and makes off with a bunch of Sybil's books. I'm so hungry for knowledge. Actually, no, the thief just throws them into a fire. Now the book is extra hot. Cut to Seth jogging, or I think it's jogging. What the fuck is that? <laughs> Jess catches up with him and they have a nice talk. Ah, yes, the baby is getting quite big now. They head to the bookstore where Sheriff Metzger is investigating. There was a threatening note left behind made from magazine clippings, of course. Only the sins of Castle Cove was destroyed, and Jess expresses concern to Sybil that perhaps her characters were too recognizable and hurtful to the real people they were based on. They are interrupted by a phone call, and it's Corinne, the nail technician at the beauty parlor. Turns out that Sybil has a mole and is a huge gossip monger. She's back in town to get more information for her next book. In fact, the book burning kind of churns her butter. She's very pleased to hear it's driving everyone nutty. Miriam is a wreck because the book reveals she was having an affair with the butcher. In fact, everyone seems to be involved with the butcher and he seems to have a fondness for married women. Really? This guy? I mean, I guess I like a guy who knows how to handle his meat. Wait, isn't that the cop from Wayne's World? Huh. 
Yeah, I definitely smell a pork product of some type. Unfortunately, due to word of mouth, Miriam's husband does find out about the affair, as does the butcher's mom. What's the matter? Don't you know any single women? Mrs. Mulligan, it's just a book. It's, it's a work of fiction. It's a total fabrication. We'll see, dearie. We'll see. <laughs> so this woman's dead. Miriam has been found dead in her kitchen, hit on the head with a frying pan. She was just trying to fix up some spaghetti sauce, and instead, it fixed her. <laughs> Jess takes a moment to talk to Sybil, even making what I perceive as a passive-aggressive slight on her writing. I'm just researching my next book. I want to get all my facts straight before I start writing. After some interrogation, Jess gets Sybil to admit that she wrote the book for revenge. She had a tough life growing up in Cabot Cove and came to resent the small town, so she used her pen as a weapon, regardless if the people in her book were to blame or not. Meanwhile, because he is a professional, Metzger gets the brilliant idea to try and follow the murders in the book to figure out the real-life murder. Seems legit. You see, in the book, the character similar to Miriam is killed with a lamp by her abusive husband, so they figure maybe it gave Noah some ideas, and he decided to kill Miriam in a similar fashion. Jess doesn't quite buy it because, quite honestly, Metzger is always wrong. Excuse me, but what the hell are these horrifying paintings in the beauty shop? Lips? Anyway, Sybil's spy, Corinne, haphazardly admits that Sybil has been getting information from the beauty shop. She spills a little too much tea, like the whole kettle. Tea is freaking everywhere now. Since she knows Sybil is back in town, Eve goes to Jess's house to give her the what for, chastising her for using Corinne to eavesdrop. It is revealed that Miriam was supposed to break things off with the butcher the same night of her murder, so he becomes the main suspect. Jess and Metzger approach him, and he denies the murder. However, the deputy finds a black hoodie and a baseball bat in his house, similar to what the book thief was seen wearing. Jessica, being the observant woman she is, notices it is way too small for Mulligan, the butcher, but it might belong to someone else in the house. Rose Mulligan, his tough-as-nails mother. <laughs> She just wanted to protect her son's reputation since the expose portrayed him as a homewrecker, so she burned the books. Who'd want to buy sausages from a man that played around with married women? I mean, you never know, some people like spicy sausage. On an unrelated note, I like how salty Metzger gets whenever Jess starts to figure out the crime before he does. Mrs. Fletcher, can I see you a minute? Why don't I understand anything? Jessica actually sympathizes with Rose and decides to talk the book owner, Mr. Ellis, about dropping the charges. I'm not sure why she deserves a break. She's not exactly pleasant. The woman that seduced my boy will be struck down as if by the hand of God. <laughs> While Jess is convincing Ellis to drop the charges, they start discussing the book and the speculation that the murderer was using it as inspiration. He makes mention of the murder in the book. That involved a woman and a lamp. Only by accident, he describes the actual murder scene which involved Miriam and a frying pan. That was not public knowledge. Jessica realizes his egregious error, and in the end, this John Waters lookalike is our killer. Why'd he do it? Well, you may recall earlier Ellis making an unwanted pass at Miriam, and he took this rejection rather poorly. <laughs> Ha! <laughs> ha! Basically, Miriam's character referred to Ellis's character as a geek, a bookworm, and this angered him so much that he bonked her on the head with a skillet. Oh god, the murderer is an incel? She should have loved me! I loved her so much! Blech. A little time passes, and everyone is back at the beauty parlor. Even Jess is there, explaining that Sybil left Cabot Cove once again because she was offered a movie deal for her book. She also assures everyone that she dialed it back a bit for the screenplay, and everyone is all happy again. She better, if America sees what's going on, everybody will want to live here, and I don't have enough chair. <laughs> Seriously, what is up with these lips? Okay, final thoughts. For me, this is one of the more memorable episodes. I have a soft spot for ones that take place in Cabot Cove because of the recurring characters. I love the parlor ladies, many of them played by well-known actresses. I also really like Sheriff Metzger. Don't get me wrong, the original Sheriff, Sheriff Tupper, has a place in my heart. I adore Tom Bosley, but he wasn't as proactive as Metzger. And Metzger's facial expressions give me life. He's so clueless, I love it. This is also a fun mystery to try and solve on your own, even though the revealing clue came much later on. It felt like one of those cozy murder mysteries, also referred to simply as cozies. If you are not familiar, those are described as a type of mystery where gratuitous elements like violence are downplayed, and they are often set in a small town with recurring characters. 
It's the kind of mystery book or movie you'd want to watch by a fire with some hot chocolate, or if you're like me, a 24 ounce mug of pure espresso. Not all of the Murder, She Wrote episodes are brilliantly written, as we've seen in some of my previous reviews, but this one is pretty solid. I didn't enjoy it ironically, there were some serious parts, some great insight from Jessica, and some great gossip, so I do give this episode a more serious recommendation. If you have an episode of Murder, She Wrote you are dying to see me cover, please leave a suggestion in the comments, and until next time, Happy sleuthing. Hey everyone, thank you for watching my Murder, She Wrote review. If you are interested in more things related to murder mystery, I will link some at the end of this video. But first, how would you feel about giving me money in exchange for little rewards? I know, it sounds absolutely thrilling. There's a site for that called Patreon and it helps me to keep this channel going. And I even bought a printer today, a printer! If you cannot afford to become a patron, no worries, likes and shares are also appreciated. Here are the videos I promised I would link to. On the left we have a very silly episode of Murder, She Wrote, and on the right I have a Magnum P.I. episode where Tom Selleck gets dunked on the entire time. How can one resist? Thank you again for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next one.